Hello, I'm May Musk, and thank you to Chase at Ever Forward to invite me to be a guest. And uh, this, his stories are wonderful, and I'm the author of A Woman Makes a Plan, but it's for men too. <laughs> And uh, you will find yourself in this book. And I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and a model, 72 years old, with 12 grandchildren. Miss Musk, finally, May. here we are. May. Okay, you're <laughs> May. Excellent. I appreciate your patience, and uh, it's been a pleasure just spending a few moments with you before we hit record. Um, how are you today? Greetings from downtown Los Angeles. Fine. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, we, I was kind of sharing my story with you, uh, the background, the commonalities of, of wellness, of health, of wellness, physical health, mental health, emotional health, spiritual. Uh, once we really tap into that word wellness, uh, I think we realize it means a lot of different things. Um, I'm curious, what is your definition of wellness? How have you come to define it and experience it? I de define it as science and common sense. In so, other words, the way you eat and the way you work out, you follow science and common sense. <laughs> What was your journey? What, what was your beginning? Were you starting and following science first? Were you following common sense first? I, I assume that, or maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe you didn't start off blended with the two together. Uh, were you kind of following one path first? Well, I did a Bachelor of Science degree, started at 17, and I graduated at 21. So as a registered dietitian. And that's when um, uh, I got married and had three children in three years. So that doesn't give you an opportunity to go out and work. Oh. So then instead, I worked from home and I would then do counseling. And as I counseled the patients from the doctors would send their patients to me, it could be just for general uh, well, uh, eating well, or it could be mainly diabetes, heart disease, osteoporosis, cancer, arthritis, or any nutrition-related diseases. And so that's why um, uh, I would help my patients eat well and use their common sense because there's a lot of fad diets out there and there's a lot of myths. And especially, I would say, now, now that I don't counsel, it's the last five years I've been traveling the world as a speaker more, um, the, the myths have gone crazy, you know, all the, all Disabled. the beliefs and all the, all, all the weird things that are happening. And I, I'm glad I, I don't counsel, but my clients always listen to me because they had to pay me for my services. So then you listen and you don't follow fair diets. Someone that has been doing this personally, professionally for, for, for years now, uh, I'm curious, this is where I would like, love to pick your kind of professional timeline brain. What have you seen? that was the fad and that was the truth then when it comes to our nutrition and our just whole health wellness now? I mean, is it true that things really do go in cycles as much as we think in this industry or have just some myths and, and half truths always remain constant? Um, yeah, I would say the fads come and go. And 45 years ago when I started counseling, there was the grapefruit diet and there was the potato diet. Potato Again, diet. have heard, heard of those? One. You haven't heard those? No. But, so that went away. And then, then there was the Atkins diet. Mm, of course. That you've heard of. So what happens is um, uh, I, was, I did my Master of Science degree, and the main nutrition researcher at the, in, in Johannesburg, he would, he would be invited to give talks because he was brilliant. But when people would say, uh, uh, what about the Atkins diet? He didn't know about fair diets. He only knew about science. And he would say, what are they talking about? So he would take me along to answer the questions from all the fair diets that were coming out. And uh, then I would explain to him what these people are reading about and what they believe. And then he would say, why? Why do they believe that? That's not what science is. <laughs> yeah. And I'd say, um, because it's popular and it's a bestseller and people are, are promising to heal people. And in, in my profession, I cannot say I healed you of diabetes. I can only say I reduced your risk. 
So I'm not a healer so much as I just make you healthier in, by following um, the basic gate guidelines. Of course, uh, of course. And um, we all have a unique origin to, to this, especially I, I think people who do it for a living uh, like yourself. And I was sharing with you kind of my origin story of what, what I went through and how I found myself studying it and then doing it professionally. What was that for you? Did you go through some kind of health crisis or injury or um, just uncertainty of you know, what was in your family? You know, why health and wellness as a profession? What was maybe that catalyst for you to really get into it um, you know, for a living? Well, I was a science nerd, so I was going to study the sciences. And then my father said, you should have a, a profession after you've got your degree, because I was going to specialize in microbiology or biochemistry, which I love. And then I had I decided, oh, what is available? And there was dietetics. So then I did two years of medicine and then specialize in nutritional sciences. But I had to go to an Afrikaans university. So I learned to speak Afrikaans at the same time. I didn't learn very well. I had to study more in Afrikaans, but <laughs> I didn't become completely fluent until I did my master of science degree at, a, at an Afrikaans university when I was 32. Uh, after my divorce, I went and did it. And then I became fluent because no one could speak English. Oh, uh, let's go back to that story if we could. You know, you're originally from South Africa, correct? Originally from Canada, and Canada, I grew up in me. South Africa. Okay. Um, that is such a unique perspective. Uh, I have been born and raised here in America, but through the military and through my own personal endeavors, I've traveled the world. And, and I've had a really eye-opening experience to, to what health means to different civilizations, different countries, people. Uh, and I personally believe that other countries kind of do it better. Uh, I think you know, <laughs> uh, in terms of just, you know, daily activity and, and joy and happiness and all the other variables that we often don't think of first when it comes to wellness, you know, right? Fitness and nutrition, predominantly two main things. In my opinion, you know, especially Europe, um, it's just fulfillment, it's joy, it's love, it's fellowship, it's daily activity, all really just improve life and reduce all cause mortality. You originally being from Canada, growing up in South Africa and now being here in the States, I would be curious, what has been your experience of those groups of people and how they value and how they practice wellness? Well, I would say Americans are scared of eating because of they, they I can't eat this, I can't eat that. And I say, well, why not? Like they'll say, I can't have anything with sugar. Well, you bring me chocolates. <laughs> and I will eat them. I don't think that it's going to kill me, you know? No. I, and they say, oh, I can't believe you're having a chocolate. And I'm saying, yes, you can have a chocolate. You just have to uh, decide for yourself. You know, you, you eat well most of the times. And when there are treats, it's wonderful. I mean, mm -hmm. but uh, the one thing you need to know where you're weak, where I'm weak is don't bring me a box of chocolates. And that's in my book too. Because those chocolates you have to take home because if I open that box, I lose control. Mm. In some way, and some of my clients, they would lose control with, with uh, salty foods. Like if you open a bag of chips, they would finish it. And, you know, without even thinking about it, and then they'll say, what's this empty packet doing next to me while I watch television? And so yeah. then their trigger foods, what I call trigger foods, would be um, salty foods. And you cannot have them nearby because unconsciously you will be eating. That doesn't happen in Europe. In mouth. Yeah. yeah. In Europe, you don't see that happening. You don't see people just snacking all the time and, and, and buying a lot of donuts and, you know, they will eat one croissant. They it's funny you say croissant. that, you know, today is actually national donut day here in America. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> the health coach knows this because I love donuts. <laughs> yum, yes. And there's so many varieties now. So you have to have one of each, which is not right. <laughs> Hey, very true. Very true. And I'll give you a quick recommendation here. If you're ever out and about in Los Angeles in the Southern California area, have you ever had sidecar donuts? If you, are you a donut fan at all? Um, I'm not a big donut. I'm more a muffin mm. and a cookie fan, but um, uh, I try to avoid them because, sure. you know, when you talk about donuts, I would probably try, oh, let me try just three different flavors. I would finish all three. That's the problem. Well, if you're ever in the mood to finish all three of a donut variety, uh, they've got vegan and they've got an incredible, I guess you could call healthier line. Uh, if you're ever in the mood, highly recommend sidecar donuts. Okay, let me explain to you. Vegan donuts are still donuts. They are not healthy. 
they're not healthy, but if you have a belief system that vegan, that, that um, you want to follow a vegan diet, then you can have it, but don't, don't just, they're still donuts. They, right. They're not healthier. And then I noticed there's a lot of gluten-free. Well, gluten is a protein that's in wheat, rye, and barley. And there's nothing wrong with gluten unless you have celiac disease. So if you have celiac disease, it's really harmful. And it can hurt your, you know, it will be painful and you will have a huge discomfort. And it's really serious, a serious disease. So if you think gluten-free is healthy, if you're gluten-free donut, um, it's not either. It is. It's just a, it's a clever marketing, right? And look, at again, they just want a donut, for sure. <laughs> you know what happened is the funny thing was when they brought out oils that were cholesterol-free, and I think that was in the 80s, I would say um, you make cholesterol in the liver. A plant doesn't have a liver, so it doesn't have cholesterol. So when your oil is from a plant, sunflower, olive oil, it will be automatically cholesterol-free unless you put cholesterol into the oil, which you're not going right. to do. So for, that's also a marketing strategy. You, you said a key, well, two key words a few moments ago um, around wellness and around decision-making, and that's belief system. And I, I think when it comes to I'm just kind of speaking in generalities here and reflecting back on my years of working in practice. Belief system, that's really when we got down to fundamental change, when we got down to adherence, when we got down to longevity and setting realistic goals and quantifying success and qualitatively how that feels along the way. Um, it really came down to the person's belief system. And I can say that because I can look back and, you know, the people who had the most success, so the longevity in the game, but also me, um, when I tried to adopt a diet or manipulate my nutrition or training, it was really why it wasn't just like, this is guaranteed going to give me results, but this, you know, who am I as a human being? Why am I latching on to this belief system? Why am I latching on to this way of eating and training? Um, and what, what was my upbringing? You know, what, what have I been brought up to believe of? this is good, this is bad, this is how you eat, this is how you exercise. Would you agree that when it comes to fundamental change in someone's health, uh, it really takes more, it, it goes peeling into the layers of their belief system of, of why they're eating, when they're eating, you know, that mindless kind of habit of hand to mouth and chip and stuff is, it's, uh, it's the habits leading up to that, right? It's the belief systems we have yeah. around downtime and eating. Right. When, when people would come to see me, I would take their dietary history, see what they are eating, why they're eating, when they are eating. Many eat because of stress, boredom, tired, anxious, happy. There are different reasons for eating, emotional reasons. And those have to, you have to get rid of those reasons. You need to eat when you're hungry. And when I, <clears throat> when I would say it to my clients, they would say, but I'm never hungry. And I'll say, you have to wait until you are hungry. And then you have to have the right foods around, foods that you enjoy. Because when you have a delicious salad, it's delicious. When you have a delicious slice of whole wheat bread, it's fresh, it's delicious. You don't have to get to that starvation level where there's donuts nearby, I'm going to get those. You know, I mean, sometimes, today, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then the clients would see me every week. And they would keep track of everything they ate, their activity, and they'd have uh, any reasons that they went off their meal plan. And because the meal plan would be there to suit, suit them and with the foods that they liked. And that's what a dietitian does. He or she will uh, go through exactly the foods you like. So, for example, I don't like kale, but if my client likes kale, they can eat kale. And, you does, and by not eating kale, it doesn't mean that I'm going to suffer. I can eat broccoli or Brussels sprouts, which I enjoy. You have to eat the foods you enjoy and don't uh, have these juices that, oh, it tastes terrible, but it's really good for me. No, that's nonsense. It's not going to work. Uh, it may be for a, sh a few days, a short period of time for sure, but longevity, yeah. no, not so much. Um, if we could, I'd like to kind of shift to another profession that you had and another thing that clearly was fulfilling work for you. 
So you found health and wellness for your own personal self. You found it to you know, be fulfilling personally. You began to work in the field. Um, how did you carry over this belief system to honoring the body um, inside and out in, the, you know, in an industry that often struggles with that, in the beauty industry and modeling? Um, you have had an incredible career doing that as well. And look, I'm not going to pretend or make any claims that I know anything about it other than just outside looking in. But I have to imagine when it comes to eating habits, when it comes to physical activity, when it comes to, you know, external appearance, appearance, that industry was more difficult than just day to day living. How did you bring these beliefs into that industry? How did you model, no pun intended, um, wellness in the beauty industry? Yeah, I, I don't work on a belief system at all. I work on science. So when, um, when I was a teenager, I was a size eight because that was a, a typical size for a model. And now I'm a size six because this is a better uh, um, size to be. Many models are size zeros or size twos. Those are the main runway models. Some of them are naturally lean. Some of them have to make a huge effort. Uh, I make a huge effort to be a size six because it keeps me in good health. However, in my 30s, I went through a stressful time and I ate all the foods I love. And it was burgers and fries and, and you know, fried chicken and chocolates and that kind of food, ice cream. Food. I mean, I loved it and I gained 65 pounds. And at the same time, they brought out plus size modeling. So I was the top plus size model in South Africa oh, and wow. I would do the runway shows. I would travel around because they needed one plus size model. And uh, I would have campaigns just as a plus size model. But then, of course, my health deteriorated. So then I had to get my, my eating habits under control. And I've managed to, to keep that 65 pounds off for, for 30 years now. And it does keep me in good health and gives me a lot of energy. And uh, so, uh, but it's hard. I have to have healthy food around me all the time. I cannot uh, allow myself to get hungry. I cannot, if I bring in any ice cream, I will finish it. I'm with you and on I, that. I will allow myself to do it. I will allow myself. I will say, okay, dinner is a pint of ice cream. <laughs> and that has happened twice this year, actually once during COVID, of course. <laughs> no one's going to blame you for that one. <laughs> I know. And then I thought to myself, you know, I don't feel so good afterwards. And I can't control it. I can't just have half a pint. It's too delicious. So then you need to know where you are weak and it takes a lot of willpower. And my twin sister, she keeps on saying, people think you are naturally lean. They don't know that you plan every day's eating habits and that you, you, you are restricting yourself to treats, mm -hmm. to, to high fat, high sugar treats. And I have to restrict myself and have a lot of willpower, but then it's worth it when you can have a lot of energy and be in good health. I, I agree. I agree. Absolutely. It's what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you, you went through a lot of different experiences in, in what you did, what you didn't do, what you ate, what you didn't eat. And they were all kind of related to these kind of seasons of your life that I'm, I can certainly relate to. I know the viewer, the listener can certainly relate to. Um, but in that, you allowed yourself to go through it, but then you, you paid attention to what your body was telling you. You paid attention to, hey, maybe for these months, this year, who knows, I need to, I need to, I want to give in and I'm not going to hold myself, you know, I'm not going to hold a grudge against that for, you know, stress, for happiness, for whatever. But then you paid attention to, I can feel better. I know what good feels like. And then you paid attention to that biofeedback and then kind of just rerouted course. Um, was it just that fluid for you? Were you just that aware but of? It's all in my book, the long details about okay, it. Okay. We'll have to tune in for that. For the and, um, but as I say, now it's pretty much, I eat well, most of the time. Okay. And in your career uh, of modeling in you know, the beauty industry, oh, I have yes. to imagine you were the, the, the one who everyone was going to for this advice, right? Like, oh, like, what are you eating? How, how do you look so no, good? Because um, I wouldn't tell people on a modeling job, I wouldn't tell people I'm a dietitian. Oh, really? Then, no, because then they want to tell me, they say, I suppose you want to know what I ate today. And I don't. 
I don't. I really just want to work as a model. And everybody said, look at all the pills I'm taking. You must be happy about that. And I say, well, I don't take any. So I don't take any supplements. So why would I be happy about you taking any? And then it's a whole process. And then, oh, you're insulting me for my knowledge on nutrition. And, 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 then, and it upsets people if I try to give them advice on a modeling set. So I never told people I was a dietitian. I don't, and as a dietitian, I never told my patients that I'm a model. Because, Interesting. Because the thing is, um, I, uh, yeah, it just they, they two, the two were separate. Although now, as a as a speaker traveling around the world, I'm talking more about anti aging and feeling good in your 70s because I'm 72, and that that includes eating well, but it also feels. Uh, you have to feel good about yourself. You have to be active. You have to work out. And you have to um, keep educating yourself. And particularly women need to not be uh, shunned or put aside as they get older. You know, women are, put as, are, are ignored and men are become CEOs and presidents. You know? <laughs> so we need to uh, <laughs> make sure that changes a bit. And uh, so as a model, I was... Uh, I, you know, now that I do the big couturier shows, they make clothes specially for me to fit my size, which is a size six. But most of the models are slim, and they, and most of them are naturally lean. I see how they eat; they're not restricting themselves. But some are eating I'm a long way. healthy yeah. food. Yes, some are eating only healthy food, and then I, that's a good idea too. How did your family receive this? Were they kind of on board or was it just, hey, mom's in the kitchen preparing um, what she's going to eat and the whole family is going to eating, is going to wind up eating it as well? Uh, was your family as receptive and on board to this kind of uh, approach to n nutrition and feeling good and looking good? Oh, my children would have loved uh, um, uh, candy in the home or cake or whatever. There was never any. And I remember when my daughter turned 21, she had a, a birthday party in, a, at, in, in our rent-controlled apartment in Toronto. <laughs> and, uh, and I had a cake there for And one of, the, one of her friends comes along and says, there's cake, there's cake in this house. <laughs> so then they said, What's happening? And then, yeah, so, so the, other, the other girlfriend said, well, what's the problem? She says, look, she takes them to the kitchen and opens the cupboard. Look, there's never anything to eat in this home. And she opens the fridge. It's just fruits and vegetables and nuts and bean stew and cereals and milk and yogurt, that type of thing. Just quality food, quality yeah. nutrition, quality ingredients. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you would agree with me that when we focus on quality ingredients in all areas of our life, quality people, quality relationships, quality job, quality pastimes, professions, our overall wellness in, increases. Would you agree? That is exactly like my book. It's, uh. it's, it's all different situations. There's only, a, uh, there's only one section on nutrition and health. Amazing. That section is on adventure. In other words, you need to explore things and find uh, um, fun and exploring uh, we're, Up into the unknown. Yeah, about the Kalahari Desert and about exploring Africa and things like that. And then, of course, I started my business in eight cities in three countries. And I had to rewrite exams. And I did another Master of Science degree at the University of Toronto. And uh, I was a research officer there. So the thing is, you, you have to explore other things, you know. So that's I the agree. adventure side. Then the success side which is the second section is entrepreneurship, running your own business or being happy in your work. If you are not happy in your work, you need to change it. And that's scary. It's always scary to change, but you cannot remain unhappy. If you are the CEO of the company and someone's disruptive, but they're very good, but they're disruptive, it is time for them to go. You cannot have everybody miserable because of this. And that's what a man who read my book said, I got rid of, a man in the office who I thought was a genius. And when I got rid of him, I said to the staff, I'm so sorry I had to fire this guy. And everyone in the staff said, what took you so long? <laughs> so you, and he says, thank you. I saved him and his whole company. And then my next section would be on um, beauty. And of course, that's the modeling industry, but then that's more for women about how to dress well, how to walk tall. Well, for men, walk tall, be comf uh, confident as well, but also makeup and hair tips and, and 
wardrobe tips. Then the next section would be on um, uh, uh, health, of course. And the fifth section, oh, I've even, hmm? Oh, yeah, it's all about my family. I'm saying, what am, what am I think, forgetting about my family, how I brought up my children, uh, teaching them exactly the same as what my parents taught me, to be independent and be responsible for your actions and do good for people. And, and my three children have done very nicely. I'm very proud of them. Mm. No one, I think, would disagree with you there, um, <laughs> which actually brings up another question. Another okay. question. I'm so sorry. We have around like five to seven minutes before the next interview. So if you have uh, time for like one or two more questions, that we would be uh, very appreciate. Absolutely. Can do. Um, let me ask uh, one more question and then we'll get into my final question. I asked all my guests, um, you know, speaking of your children and your family, I, I think for, for us to have long lasting change in the world, uh, but also to just have longevity in our wellness, it really does take a community. And if we can get our communities and our families together and just, you know, provide fulfillment, provide nourishment, look at what is possible. I mean, yes. you, your career, I mean, you here today are just a literal beautiful example of what the human potential can do when you honor it and your children and your family are doing that in their own unique way. Would you say, do you like to take a little credit here and say that you know, <laughs> the nutrition, the meals and all this stuff is, you know, helping us get on Mars with all the work that your son is doing? And <laughs> well, well, first of all, uh, last week was an exciting week. Incredible. Congratulations first, again. Yeah, well, first of all, Tosca had the premiere of Passion Flicks virtually. All right. Kimball opened one of his restaurants for the first time in many months. I had my book published in Russia, and then Elon launches this, the astronauts to the International Space Station. So, of course, there were three good successes, and then there's one extraordinary success, and we are all very proud of him and very happy for America. Amazing. And congratulations yeah. again to you and your family. Huge accomplishment. Um, one question I did get uh, real quick is, everyone wants to know, please pronounce your, your new grandchild's name. How, yeah. how, X. 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 Simple enough. We always often try to overcomplicate things. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, May, it's been a pleasure having you on here. I want to be respectful of your time and uh, let you get on with your day here. Um, thank thank you, you and keep on doing your good work. Thank you. Thank you. A, a life of health, wellness, fitness, and nutrition is the foundation for my life and you know the content here. But it's about fulfillment and it's about happiness and it's about the quality of ingredients in all areas of my life as well. And you're clearly an example uh, of that. Um, so I, I received that and I thank you for, for literally modeling that for future generations. Um, the final question I ask everyone is, you know, the show, the brand ever forward is, uh, it comes from a time when I didn't really have these luxuries. It came from a time when I was physically broken when I was emotionally broken. Um, the loss of my father, just a lot of poor quality ingredients in my life to bring it full circle. But through that, I realized that I could change that recipe. I could change the quality of my life if I decided if I decided to move forward, ever forward, was this philosophy, this mantra from my late father. When you hear that, what does that mean to you? How would you say that May Musk lives a life ever forward? I would say that if you go through my book, you'll go through all the struggles I had. My children wanted me to talk about the struggles and how you can make a plan to end a bad situation just like you have and, and do positive things after that and have a better life. And you'll see that you will, you will ad identify with, with many uh, chapters in my book. Uh, no doubt. Absolutely. In many areas. Um, so, I mean, that echoes so strongly with us here at Everford. So I thank you for that answer. There's never a right or a wrong answer. It's yours for sure. Thank um, you.